So hypoxia is one of you know our we got we can we can basically say that the cause of death plus you um, can basically be uh, be narrowed down to like seven seven big causes and hypoxia or hypoxemia is is one of them. Um, so that's why you know when we've got a patient where we think that you know we're concerned about about hypoxemia you know they're they're having trouble breathing getting oxygen on them you know well well I guess you know it might not benefit everybody getting oxygen on them will will if they are having an issue will will at least move them in the right direction immediately does that make sense so respiratory distress common finding complaining of shortness of breath so I want to talk about this a little bit. When somebody's in respiratory distress, they might say they're short of breath. They might say they're feeling like they just can't catch their can't catch their breath, um, having trouble breathing. Um, sometimes they'll say they're having chest pain. Um, it can be a wide variety of things that and how they they feel like they're experiencing the respiratory distress. They're not always going to say they're feeling short of breath. Um, restlessness. So why why are patients why would patients in respiratory distress feel restless? Not in shock, but they're but nervous. what's that? Nervous. Yeah. Well, so their their body is stressed, yeah. and so when their body is stressed, it releases a whole bunch of what we call catecholamines that that basically causes their whole body to say, "Hey, I'm in trouble. I need to do something to fix this." Now, part of what the body does to fix it is, you know, increases respiratory rate, opens up lungs a little bit more, but it also sort of kind of kicks everything into into high gear. And so, what what are uh, for, for us, we say that you know if a patient is restless, if they're agitated, you need to rule out hypoxia, hypoxemia immediately. We say that you know um, restlessness is caused by hypoxemia until until deemed otherwise. So you know they could be restless, they they could be agitated, they could be moving around, they could be fidgety, because I mean their body is saying there's something, there's a threat that that that's a danger to me. Um, increased or decreased pulse rate. So why would why would the pulse increase for a patient who's in respiratory distress? Because they're trying to compensate by getting blood through more. Exactly. So the, the body trying to compensate. So a lot of times we're going to see an increased respiratory rate. I'm sorry, increased pulse. And then once we start seeing a decrease, that's actually kind of like our the they're they're getting ready to crash. So you know you'll you'll see you know pulse will go 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140. And then once the body can't compensate anymore, it's just it, it no longer has enough oxygen to actually function. Then you just start it's, it's gonna decrease pretty rapidly. Now, I when when the heart rate is decreasing, you've got you know, you've got like maybe a minute or two before <coughs> before they go into cardiac arrest. But they're still you're still able to turn them around. Um, we see it we see it a lot when we're intubating patients. You know, we're intubating a patient. You know they're not breathing because we had to pull the bag back, bag mouth bag mask away, and then the heart rate. We'll say, oh, heart rate's dropping. That's our that's our last step before before they get ready to crash. Um, change in breathing rate or depth. So, patients in respiratory distress, if they're able to, they'll try and compensate by breathing more. If they're if their breathing is shallow, so. Well. We're talking about what we call tidal volume, how much, or, or minute volume, which is how much the patient is, is actually breathing in a minute measured. If a patient isn't able to breathe, is needed to take more shallow breaths, they're gonna compensate by taking more of them. Now, it's not, it's not gonna be as adequate, but, but the body is able to compensate by, by breathing more. Um, just kind of like the other way, if a patient is able to take very large breaths, then they don't need to breathe as many times, as much as often to get the same minute volume, minute volume, minute volume is called noise breath. Um, so if if you know a patient is breathing, you know, 30 times a minute, the patient's probably compensating. Um, maybe they, they aren't able to take as large deep breaths, so that's how they have to. Maybe they're having an oxygenation issue and they're able to take those deep breaths, but they're having such an oxygenation issue. They're they're taking that normal breathing uh, breathing volume and increasing it to 30. 
skin color changes. So we talked a little bit about uh, the bluish, the cyanosis. So that's, that is a clear cut indication the patient does not have enough oxygen in the tissue. Um, what about if skin color is pale? So pale, a lot of times we equate it with um, hypoperfusion. So patient is clamped down, all of their, all of their, uh, their vasculature is shutting, is clamping down. Maybe it's not able to get enough blood to the tissue because they're losing blood or they're, they're in shock for, for a variety of ways. But really anything other than warm, pink, and dry is, is a concern. You just gotta figure out which way and why. They are going to the shop from researchers in their uh, like neck muscles, chest. Yeah, it's history. Neck yeah. muscles, history. Well, so for shock, there, there's just so many different kinds yeah. of types of shock. So if a patient is in shock, it's generally not necessarily related to, to a respiratory thing. Um, it's kind of a byproduct. Yeah. I got you. So respiratory stress causes. Um, so narrowing of the bronchioles from inflammation, swelling, or bronchoconstriction. So that's what we talked about earlier, where if it's, there's a narrowing or if it's plugged up by something. Um, so if, if the oxygen isn't actually able to get down into the alveoli like we, like we showed, um, then you need something that, that's able to, to open it back up. So we talked about um, if you've got asthma, the, the bronchodilators. Um, now, uh, injuries to the head, neck, face, spine, chest, or abdomen um, can cause uh, respiratory distress through a couple that's, um, so I mean, if, if you've got injuries uh, to, you know, the face, the neck, anything that sort of uh, limits the actual pathway down into the lungs, then a patient's gonna, is naturally gonna have trouble breathing. What we see a lot is that, you know, if you get hit in the neck, um, then yeah, there might be immediate trauma to, to the pathway, but if the patient survives that, then there's gonna be swelling because you got hit there, the, the whole area is gonna swell. So you know maybe an hour later, they start talking about having trouble breathing, all of that swells up. Um, especially for like burns, um, patient is, is, is burned and they inhale a whole bunch of hot gas you know, they might walk out of the burning building feeling okay, but then in the next 10 minutes, all that inflammation is going to, is what's going to be blocking, actually is what's going to kill them. So that's why, you know, for those patients, they actually tell us, you know, I don't care if that person is walking, breathing, talking okay for that second, if they just walked out of the burning building, you need to think about getting a tube in before that closes up. Um, and then injuries to um, chest or abdomen, it can cause issues. What we see is that, I mean, if you get hit in the chest, you know, you break some ribs, you don't want to take this deep breath. You take this breath. Because you don't want to, I mean, it's going to be painful as hell. Um, also, you know, abdomen, just because really the diaphragm does really push down into the abdomen. Um, if you have injuries down there, you're not going to want to push that diaphragm down mm -hmm. into that. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of times these patients are able to sort of take those little shallow breaths for a little while. But, um, Eventually, their their need to oxygenate is is or their need to ventilate. I'm sorry, the ventilation issue um, is going to overcome that pain. So either they're going to start breathing through the pain because that's their body's going to realize that that's going to take priority, or what we really try to do is that we just give them some pain medication so that they're more able to easily take those take those deep breaths. You're not going to have a patient who's going to die because it's too it's too painful to take those breaths. Their body is going to realize that that takes priority, whether they realize it or not. It's like, um, this is a good example. Oh, can't really think of um, Cardiac compromise. Um, so, like we, so the heart and the lungs are are really interconnected. Um, in the end, you know, all the blood goes from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, to the rest of the body. And if you're having issues with your heart, if your heart isn't able to pump well the blood to the lungs or, or you know, get the, get the blood back to the lungs, 
then you're going to you're gonna the body is going to have respiratory you know respiratory compromise, which it we'll we'll talk into get into it in a little bit about about how you know cardiac and and respiratory you know issues and symptoms can start kind of mirror or mask each other or kind of really stay, be super connected. Um, and then hyperventilation, um, I'm not a fan of, of this, you know, I know this goes into it in a, in a little bit. Um, a patient can be hyperventilating for a million different reasons. A lot of times a patient is hyperventilating uh, to, to compensate for something, um, but you know, in a little bit it touches on when, when patients can hyperventilate more from, you know, things like anxiety, panic attacks, all sorts of stuff. I'm okay with pain, hyperventilating over a panic attack. Because what's gonna happen, this isn't, this isn't textbook, but if a patient's hyperventilating from a panic attack, they're gonna pass out, and then they're gonna start breathing normally. And then we fix the problem. That's not a textbook. So um, we'll get into that in a little bit. You wanna coach their breathing. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk all about it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, other causes, abdominal conditions. Um, so when, uh, when there are issues in the abdominal cavity, you can actually push up um, against, uh, against the whole respiratory system in general, push up on the diaphragm, push up on the lungs, which is why, you know, especially uh, patients that have large habitus are, are um, you know, obese, they say, you know, you really can't lie them flat um, or certain positions where you actually can sort of invert them because all the stomach contents are, are sort of pushed up against the diaphragm, makes it a lot harder for the diaphragm, diaphragm to lower. Um, but also you'll have other conditions where, you know, uh, everything in the abdominal compartment becomes, you know, distended or abdominal compartment. Anyways, uh, become enlarged and then specifically pushes up, which then causes respiratory issues. And those get difficult because it's not really exactly a lot you can do for them. But, um, Dysfunction of the respiratory system by mechanical disruption to the airway, lung, or chest wall. Um, so we will talk about that in a little bit, specifically trauma when there's when there's actually a break, um, because we got to talk about uh, sort of negative pressure. But uh, stimulation of the receptors in the lungs. You know, yeah, technically, but uh, inadequate gas exchange related to a ventilation or perfusion disturbance. And that's really kind of a, a catch-all that is not, you guys, you guys don't need to learn about BQ mismatches right now, so. Oh, we went over that this morning. Why? It's in the, it's in what we teach. Okay. Well, Cardiac we rhythms are in what we teach in cardiology. Okay. So, um, so what we talked about with, uh, with, you need enough oxygen to get down into the lungs, and you need enough um, blood to be going along those capillaries to, uh, to collect the oxygen. So a, a ventilation perfusion mismatch is when either, I mean really everything we've been talking about is, is talking about this, but either you're not getting enough oxygen down into the lungs, which is called not enough ventilation, or you're not getting enough blood into into the capillaries, which is called which is part of the perfusion. So when you're when one of those is is disrupted, it's called a VQ mismatch, a ventilation perfusion mismatch. There. <laughs> um, so breathing disturbance can be categorized in one of three ways, and talking about these, we're going to go from the less serious to the most significant. So respiratory distress is when the patient is compensating. Um, so adequate rate, tidal volume, um, you're, you're able to, uh, to keep the oxygenation above 94%. And we say, um, we say 94% because that's kind of like our, our, new, golden, our new gold standard. Um, we want to keep, for, for, most, for almost all patients, we want to keep the oxygen saturation above 94%. Um, except for patients with, but that gets talked about in a little bit. Um, if, the, if the oxygen saturation is low, is less than 94%, then they're going to need something, whether it is you know, a nasal cannula, a non-rebreather. And in the end, I mean, a lot of times you'll, you'll sort of figure out you know, what's appropriate. If they're starting 92, they just need a little bump. Throw them on a nasal cannula at four and see what happens. 
people, if they're satting 70%, throw them on a non-rebreather as a stopgap until we figure out if we need to, you know, ventilate this patient or we'll put them on CPAP. Um, but uh, respiratory, the patient respiratory distress, you know, they are they are compensating. And then that moves into respiratory failure. So this is a patient that is not ventilating, um, not ventilating adequately. So this is a patient that. Well, they, they might need oxygenation help, they definitely also need ventilation help. So these are patients that their their ventilation, they're they're not ventilating appropriately, the rate, tidal volume, or both are inadequate. So these are patients that, you know, you come in, they're unconscious and they're breathing, you know, four times a minute. Okay. So that's not adequate. You know, oxygen isn't going to help them because they're not they're not able to get the oxygen down into the lungs. So we're gonna bag them, bag valve mask. Um, come in and they're breathing 50 times a minute <coughs> for, for whatever reason, um, that is obviously not adequate because when you're breathing that fast, so, so when, you're, when you're breathing so fast, you are, all the oxygen is just getting, it's not getting all the way down to the lungs. <laughs> it's only getting down to you know, a trachea or lower airways and then you're shooting it right back out. So if they're not able to take you know, breaths deep enough to get down to the lungs to allow the oxygen to offload, the carbon dioxide to get in, and that's not adequate, and they need help, they need, so that's why when we bag them, it's big breaths. Um, <clears throat> and provide supplemental oxygen, so if we're bagging these patients, yes, you can bag them without oxygen, but a lot of times, um, you know, if, if a patient's having a ventilation problem, Yes, you can bag them until you get it hooked up to oxygen, because you can bag them while your partner is doing that, but really you need to be, you never really want to be bagging somebody without oxygen. So whenever you're putting a patient on VVM, you're going to say, hooking, hooking my back valve mask up to 15 liters, 100% FiO2. Um, and then may deteriorate to respiratory arrest. So respiratory arrest, they are not breathing at all. They need everything. You need to be bagging entirely. They are not oxygenating because they are not ventilating. Um, so this is what we talk about where if you stop breathing in about, you know, five to six minutes when you start having, you know, brain death, you know, six to eight minutes is when, is when they're going to die. Do you mind know what an average response time is for an ambulance? It's about 13 minutes, I think. It's about 12 minutes. Make a round time every time? Yeah. So you're already behind the eight ball when you get there. Way behind. Um, so immediately intervene with bag valve mask ventilations and supplemental oxygen. So if we are ventilating these patients with bag valve masks, what else do we need to be doing? What comes before B? Okay. So, so proper airway positioning, um, maybe an adjunct, an OPA or an NPA. You can learn about that on Canvas. Um, so you're bagging them. They're obviously not controlling their airway, so you need to control their airway and you need to start bagging them. Um, does this one go into how to bag? No, I guess, I guess it doesn't tell them how to bag. I don't we'll, think so. we'll go over that in lab, right? Yeah, most definitely. So, like we said, there are many causes of respiratory distress, but assessment and basic emergency care is the same. So, emphysema, emphysema and chronic bronchitis, these are both part of um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that, you know, we said is, you know, one of the top 10 causes of, of death in the United States. Um, but, you know, you're gonna you're gonna walk up to a patient and they're just gonna know that they have COPD. Um, the actual specifics are, are a little bit different. What happens with emphysema? So with emphysema, so the oxygen really depends on being able to use all of these areas along the lining, all the surface area, in order to be able to exchange oxygen. 
So what happens with emphysema, a lot of times um, due to chronic exposure to cigarette smoke, um, uh, workplace exposure are the two largest causes, is that actually the, the lining, the, the sides of, are actually um, uh, sort of deteriorate. So then you end up, you know, you'll lose these center walls and you kind of end up with just one big blip. Now all of a sudden, all that surface area that you had is just this. Now what can happen is that when you lose all of that inner structure, it's really easy for it to clamp down when you're trying to, trying to blow out. But um, that's, so it causes an oxygenation issue, but then also it causes problems with trying to blow out. Um, the difference between that and chronic bronchitis is that chronic bronchitis is just you know, it's, it's been irritated so much by, you know, a lot of times, you know, cigarette smoke or, or workplace exposure that you just have chronic, chronic secretion buildup along the side, whether it's in there or along there. But all of those are kind of put together and put under the umbrella term of COPD. So like we, like I just showed, we're losing all of those and then it just becomes one big sort of blob. It's, it doesn't really have the structure. And then also up in here, you can see with chronic bronchitis, just the constant um, heavy buildup of secretions. So <clears throat> lung tissue loses its elasticity, walls of the alveoli are destroyed. Um, disruption of the gas exchange occurs. Uh, the patient purses their lips while exhaling to create their own physiologic peep. So what you're going to see, you are going to see, you know, patients like this with a bit. And their body is doing that because when, when they're breathing out, since the alveoli has lost its structure, if, if they blow out all at once, then everything's going to clamp down. And then it's really hard to open it back up. So they slowly exhale, let it not completely close, and then let it open back up. It's a little, little tricky, but um, uh, patients usually complain of shortness of breath upon exertion because they, their bodies just can't compensate because they've lost all that surface area. They're not able to really respond to, to new demand for, for oxygen. Um, emphysema signs symptoms, may sign symptoms of emphysema are similar to those with the respiratory distress. You know, um, so exercise intolerance, chronic shortness of breath. Uh, some of these are the patients that um, are, are used to, to not having enough oxygen. So that's why when we said, you know, we shoot for uh, pulse ox of greater than 94%. For these patients, um, we, we allow, you know, we allow permissive um, hypoxia. Now, this is this is a case by case, but for these patients, we, we say that you know up to uh, or above eighty eight percent is generally what we what we deem acceptable. Now, if I've got a patient in respiratory distress who says I just can't catch my breath, I feel like I'm short of breath. This is due. This is due. And they're starting eighty eight. I'm going to bump them up and see how they feel. But it's the idea that you know if you're if you've got them on a non-breather and they're sat at 89 and they feel fine, then you know maybe maybe you don't need to take that next step. Um, just because these patients, you know, emphysema is something that's developed over. You know, this is a chronic condition. They didn't just wake up one day and had it. This is slow progression over 20, 30, 40 years, and so their body has built up a tolerance. Their body has said has you know developed a new lower norm. The body has said, I can tolerate, you know, 88%, 89%, 90%. So you just, you guys don't have to get freaked out over it. Um, it's, this is something that has been, you know, it's, it's pretty new to the EMS curriculum. Um, so, you know, you're not going to run into everybody who's super familiar with it. Um, and there are other dangers with giving these patients extra oxygen. They say, you know, if you give these patients too much oxygen, then They'll, they'll stop breathing, um, and that's not really, call it hypoxic drive, it's kind of overblown. 
maybe we'll talk about it when you guys are medics, but... Um, we talked about it this morning. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> So um, there are there are chemoreceptors and there are stress receptors. Talk okay. about that too. Why? I have no. It's in the it's in the material. I teach it. Okay. So um, so how do we decide when to breathe? How how does your body decide when to take a when to take a breath in? <laughs> so so there are receptors um, in the brain. There are receptors in the aorta. Um, the arch. Yep. Um, and and they so some and there are also uh, receptors in, in other parts of the lungs. And there's there's chemoreceptors that look that measure how much carbon dioxide is in the blood. And there's other receptors that measure how much oxygen is in the blood. And there's so the part of the body that tells you when to take a breath in is based off of those receptors. Um, and so this is why you know it's important to think about how oxygen and carbon dioxide, well, they both use the same system. They both use the respiratory system to take care of it. They are interconnected, but they're not the same. So that's why you know we said, you know, oxygen, not having enough oxygen is going to kill you within an end of eight minutes. Having too much carbon dioxide. Well, it's not great for you. We're learning that actually it's not, it's not going to kill you in the next hour, day, maybe even week. Um, that, that our bodies can tolerate um, excess carbon dioxide pretty well. But in the end, these receptors um, use, use a balance of those to decide when to take a breath in. Now, when we talk about these patients with, um, uh, with COPD, you know, their body has, has we talked about, it, learned to, to accept a lower norm. Their body has learned to say, okay, you know, I don't need as much oxygen as, you know, I, as originally because I'm just not going to get it. So their body is able to, to tolerate and it's, your body is always, was always kind of able to, well, their body sort of learned how to tolerate it. And their, their receptors learned to say, okay, you know, when I'm at 88%, I don't need to be freaking out. Like if you and I were at 88%. Um, but now there's concerns that um, if you give these patients oxygen and you get them up to, you know, if we treat them like other patients and get them above 94%, then that part of the brain um, that, that tells you to, to, that you don't need to breathe when you're at 88, or tells you that it's okay at 88%, would then kind of turn off and say, well, I don't need to breathe at all. Um, it's, it's kind of been debunked. It's kind of still present. Um, so, How's it been so what they found is that <coughs> for, for patients to to really suffer from a hypoxic, so this is called a hypoxic drive, um, is that uh, really they need to um, have significant history of COPD, they need to be having uh, an exacerbating factor, and even then the, the chance of it happening is pretty, is pretty minor. Um, but you're still gonna have people freaking out over you putting a patient on, with COPD on nasal cannula. I've seen more patients harmed by not getting enough oxygen because people were scared of hypoxic drive uh, than, than a patient actually. Um, and I mean, the, the time needed for to actually kick out, you know, the, the hypoxic drive is like super long. So. Um, Have you ever seen anyone ever go into a hypoxic drive? But also, you know, I've never really kind of been in the context to study it. And it's not like, you know, it's not like you're gonna have a COPD patient, you're gonna put them on an breather, and then five minutes later, they're gonna stop breathing. Um, so. Um, if they need oxygen, yeah. give them oxygen. That's the, that's the main takeaway. Don't, don't freak out if they need oxygen. Uh, so tripod position, like we talked about, trying to trying to really sort of maximize lung expansion. You are going to see patients in this position, and that is definitely a concerning thing when you walk into a room and you see that. 
Um, so CPAP or BiPAP. <coughs> Um, so CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, um, is, is a system like you see where um, it's giving a constant flow of, of air for the patient. And so it does a couple of things. Um, the main thing is that, you know how we talked about those, those patients that uh, you see the first lip breathing? They are so that their alveoli does completely clamp down. So this is what positive airway, continuous positive airway pressure, it's constantly pushing air. So as you're breathing in, it's like your head is outside a window, breathing against, against this, this huge wind. So it's sort of slowing down your exhalation. So it slows down the respiratory rate, but also it doesn't allow the alveoli to completely collapse. Now something else that it does is that um, with that extra pressure, it's actually able to increase the oxygen a little bit because, um, has anybody ever taken chemistry before? High school. High school, okay. Um, so ideal gas law, that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Anyways. When higher there's concentration, the higher concentration? Yeah. When you increase the pressure, we talk about uh, that the too. increase of, there's, there's more oxygen, the, the, the oxygen is able to have, there's able to be more molecules of oxygen. So if you increase the pressure of the patient that's breathing in anything, there's increased pressure and there's increased oxygen. Um, and so that's why, uh, so BiPAP, so CPAP is a continuous continuous pressure. It can give you a little bit of extra um, pressure of, of oxygen when you're breathing in and it's, it doesn't allow you to completely collapse your alveoli, but also when, when, you're, when you're breathing in, um, it's able to sort of push open some alveoli. Um, so it needs a little bit of extra pressure because sometimes when, the reason why we don't want alveoli to collapse is that it's really hard to open them back up. It needs some extra pressure to sort of pop it back open. And that's what, what that extra pressure can do. Now BiPAP is that when you're breathing in, it gives you a big push, big push extra pressure that A, helps you, you know, it decreases the work of breathing because the patient's really tired out from, you know, respiratory distress, they're really tired and then so that way they just need to breathe a little bit and then it's gonna breathe the air for them. It's gonna sort of push it all in at a higher pressure, so a little bit of extra oxygen. It's gonna pump open those alveoli and then also it's gonna let them take those deeper breaths when they're getting tired. Um, this is something that's, that, you know, has, so BiPAP has really hit the, hit the EMS market over the last, you know, five, five to 10 years. Um, a lot of places still don't have it. Um, most places don't even have CPAP. We have CPAP. That? Oh yeah, I, I love it. I, I was not a believer in CPAP, mm -hmm. but after using it on people and mm -hmm. seeing them turn around as fast as they have, yeah. I will stick them on it in a hot second. Yeah. So one thing that CPAP and BiPAP has really done is that it's really prevented the amount of patients that needed intubation. So that's why we it's it's a fantastic tool. Yes. But but um. We use a lot of our CHFers. Yeah. Because it pushes that fluid back out into the interstitial space. Yeah. So think about it. So if you've got all of that fluid that's in the alveoli, that little bit of extra pressure is is going to push that fluid across that membrane out of that area. Because you know, for for patients in heart failure, the reason why there's fluid in there is because the heart isn't able to push it well enough. So then it just sits there and just melts across. Through, through osmosis. Now, when you've got CPAP or BiPAP, it's able to push it back out, and it's able to sort of open up those alveoli again. Um, chronic bronchitis, swelling, thickening of the bronchi, bronchial lining. Um, alveoli remain unaffected by the disease associated with smoking, um, narrow bronchioles, reduced airflow, reduced lung ventilation with increased lung perfusion. So that's just sort of what we already talked about, you know, the chronic secretions, um, narrowing the inflammation. Now, reduced lung ventilation with increased lung perfusion. So that's what we had talked about earlier with the ventilation perfusion mismatch. So we're not getting enough ventilation because everything is narrowed. So you're not able to get, to get enough oxygen down into the lungs. So you're still getting the same amount of blood that's passing by, but it's not able to pick up any of the oxygen. So that's a ventilation issue on a ventilation perfusion you know, scale. Um, productive cough for chronic bronchitis. So, you know, you're gonna hear that junky cough 
for, for patients with chronic bronchitis, um, where, where it starts to get kind of tricky is, okay, well you've got a patient with chronic bronchitis who always has a productive cough, and now all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're coughing more. Well, maybe it's pneumonia on top of chronic bronchitis, which is what happens a lot. Well, is it just extra secretions, or is the chronic bronchitis just getting worse? Is it a new, you know, is it new inflammation from pneumonia or a virus or anything like that? Um, but but what's going to be really helpful for for assessment is okay, you know, got you got you know uh, worsening cough. Is the you know are you coughing new things up? Has the color changed in the sputum? You know, are you taking medications to control? Because a lot of these patients are taking medications to to dry out, dry out the sputum. Um, so the increase in bronchial obstruction, there is a reduction in residual volume in the lungs that can lead to bloating and cyanotic uh, appearance. So uh, sometimes the, the patients are called, um, you know, blue puffers. Blue bloaters. Blue bloaters. That's Pink right. puffers. What's that? Pink puffers. Pink puffers. Blue, blue bloaters. bloaters. Pink puffers are the patients with, with emphysema um, because they, they puff out like we talked about the, and then blue bloaters because they can sometimes have you know these char characteristic chronic cyanosis um, and um, so uh, what they talk about with the uh, with the bloating is that um, with all of the, the chronic secretions they can have trouble getting getting the air out so they can sort of Cause sort of uh, you're not able to fully compress the alveoli to then open back, to then take more oxygen back in, so then it gets sort of stuck in this consistently, you know, enlarged. So then they're not able to take the deep breaths. So it's I've never really seen it. I've never really kind of made that differentiation, but if it works, it works. Um, chronic bronchitis emergency care. Same guidelines. Like we said, I mean, a patient is having trouble breathing, a patient is having trouble breathing. If their oxygen saturation is low, um, then, then you can, you know, we say shoot for, you know, 88 to 92 um, if they've got a history. Um, we'll talk about hypoxic drive, consider use of CPAP, we already touched on. Uh, Jake quickly notes the following. Uh, if Paul applies oxygen by nasal cannula and begins asking Mrs. Brown's friends questions, Mrs. Brown is in tripod position using pursed lip breathing. She is anxious. He was able to speak three or four words at a time. The respiratory rate is 28 with adequate tidal volume. So is she in respiratory distress, respiratory failure? Respiratory stress. Respiratory stress. What well, points that out? Uh, it's not failure. Yeah, that's fair. So <laughs> I've got a position. Is there a differentiation between her respiratory rate, which is high, and the fact that she has adequate tidal volume? Does that make a difference? Yes, it does. Okay. She's breathing more with her SPO2, which should go up higher if she's getting an adequate tidal volume and breathing at a higher respiratory rate. So she's having to compensate for something or I'll be alive. Okay, so is that your clarification as too far as respiratory distress versus failure? Would failure be the high respiratory rate and inadequate tidal volume? Yeah. Okay. I'm down with it. Steven looks like he's down with it. Yeah. Everybody's down with it. But I'm, I'm down with the fact that you know that 100%. So, auscultation reveals scattered wheezing and bronchi throughout both lungs. Mrs. Brown's SpO2 is 94%. Friend states that Mrs. Brown has emphysema and has been more short of breath than usual since early this morning. If you characterize Mrs. Brown's condition as respiratory stress, respiratory failure, respiratory rest, we already talked about that. What treatments may be appropriate for Mrs. Brown? So, does Mrs. Brown need anything right now? Yes. Why? Like we were just talking about, it's her alveolus, and it's probably, uh, and I forgot we just talked about E, but uh, whatever, something in her alveolus is not working, so maybe a CPAP to get the fluid out, to put the fluid in, something about it failing. Cool, but her SpO2 is 94%, right? Yeah. It's a little high. So if she doesn't really need any oxygen, oxygen is 
oxygen wouldn't help that you might add for it, but it's not going to help because you need to get some real issue. You know, I don't know exactly how to fix it yet. Okay, good. So, so you, it's really important to recognize that even if this patient is satting 94%, she's feeling bad. She's feeling short of breath. She's in respiratory distress. Just because the patient's satting 94% doesn't mean that, that she doesn't need it. Look at your patient, not your equipment. I cannot stress that enough. Um, how should treatments be integrated with plans for transport? So you talk about CPAP. Can you guys think of, of anything else you might need? What was one of the key wires on that slide? What are breath sound like? Sound, sound no, like? what no. did her breath sounds sound like? Squeezing, scattered, and ronchi. Okay. So, so you're going to try to open her airway. Okay. So how are we going to do that? Take it with the tube. Yeah. yeah. Break your tube. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's not in your already. scope of practice. <coughs> she does she have a nebulizer. She has a nebulizer already. Mm -hmm. So find out if she's already used it. Find out if you, so we're gonna talk about meter dose inhalers in a little bit and nebulizers, but yeah. Maybe if her medication's in date. Yep. She ran out and had to use some stash that he, she had from 10 years ago, because people do that. You have to make sure that her inhaler is hers. Yes. Yeah, we'll get into that. So moving on to asthma. So increased sensitivity of lower airways leads to narrowing of the bronchioles airflow. So, you know, we all know people who, who have asthma. Um, in the end, this is, you know, the, the difference between, you know, asthma and, and COPD is that technically asthma is what we call reversible. Uh, reversible limited airflow, whereas COPD is irreversible limited airflow. So these are patients that, you know, a lot of times it's res uh, response to, uh, to certain stimuli, whether it be allergens, or you know, smoke. Uh, certain. I mean, you've got some patients with even certain types of foods. Stress, um, anxiety-induced. Yeah, uh, anxiety-induced uh, uh, exercise-induced asthma. So basically, um, their their body responds in an inappropriate way. Their body responds by by causing inflammation in the bronchioles, in the um, and then causes that swelling that we were just talking about, we can see with, uh, with COPD, we have increase in, um, in secretions, we see a tightening of the, of the bronchioles, that's then limiting all the air flow um, out and, and sometimes even in. So the bronchospasms, the edema, the increased mucus production, um, acute severe asthma or status asthmaticus is a prolonged life-threatening impact. So, you know, a patient is gonna have asthma probably all their lives. Some people grow out of it, um, but this is the thing that we talked about where you have an acute on chronic event. A patient has an asthma attack, an asthma exacerbation. They smoke a cigarette and they've never smoked before. So then all of a sudden their body responds by, by you know, increasing mucus, constricting the airways, uh, bronchospasms, edema. Um, now, Status asthmaticus um, is, is what we call, you know, an asthma exacerbation that is not responding to, uh, to, to interventions. You give these patients medications and they don't get better. Uh, so the majority, the majority of, of asthma exacerbations aren't gonna respond very well to the medications that we have. Um, and uh, a lot of times the, the mainstay is going to be these bronchodilators. Um, nebulizers, meter dose inhalers that, that you see. But when they don't respond, um, I think the fatality rate you know, goes up to like 10% or something like that. Um, then, uh, then these patients, they need, they need, a lot of times, they need to be intubated. They need to be intubated really fast. Um, so these are the patients, a lot of times, that you know, pediatrics uh, you're going to run into that they don't know how to manage it well. They're not able to recognize that they're feeling a little bit worse slowly. They, you know, get to school, they forgot to take their inhaler, they, they do something, and then you get called, and you show up, and you've got, you know, a six-year-old in, in respiratory distress. So a lot of times, asthma patients are, are what really scare, scare a lot of medics. Um, mm -hmm. Because 
not only a lot of times they're, they're little kids, but also, you know, these are patients that, uh, that are, are very hard to manage on the vent. 